Hey, we need you. Yes, hello. Welcome again uh, to the audience. I can't, I can't hear you. Uh, and uh, so, so we will make sure that we have get our speakers of the first session, which are already in the forum, the, forum, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. the Zoom call, the Zoom right, call now. right now. And, and we are putting everybody on the screen uh, for the first time. It is, they are all companies which you have seen around, which you have seen in our uh, forum, but you also have seen in other events around the world. And um, uh, my first speaker is perhaps a surprise for most of you because uh, you know his name, but you know him from another company. It's mm -hmm. Omar Bai Yuhai, Bar Yuhai. He's a, quite an old friend because we talked already when he very first started with his first idea uh, or with his idea and his first company he was founding, which is the company uh, uh, Eviation, uh, the first regional fully electric aircraft. But now he is like the uh, CEO of Autoflight International. He joined the eVTOL community. So uh, maybe uh, can you enable the screen of, o of Omer mm -hmm. and the microphone? So then I would hand over because I'm sure he has much more interesting things than me to tell you. I think you guys can probably hear me already. Yes. Omer, have Omer. you uh, switched on your microphone? Please give us a yes. quick yes. hello and... Uh, the camera should be also free from our side. No, for some reason, I can't enable camera. I do sharing. Yes. Yes. Perfect. This is your screen, but we don't see your camera yet. Maybe you can also switch on your camera. There we go. Now I see you. Hello, Omar. Great to see you again. Due to this Play. COVID, Play. haven't seen you for a long time in Rio, but I hope we'll see you soon again. Correct. And Willie, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, I, I can't believe you said I have more interesting things to say. I doubt that. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to okay. hearing more. Perfect. Then I switch off my microphone. I don't hear you at the moment. I guess only one can speak at a time. Okay, okay. Can you guys hear me okay now? We, we, we can uh, hear you in China uh, companies room. All right, perfect. perfect. So I will go right ahead. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. I do apologize that this is not in person. I actually missed this conference by less than a week. Um, just left Shanghai about uh, four days ago after a phenomenal month in seeing what China has to China offer. Has to offer. Uh, and obviously what Autoflight is, uh, is doing kind of on the ground in China. Autoflight has a lot of uh, work being done outside of China as well, but the center of gravity for manufacturing and protecting is very much uh, in its in China, and we'll talk about it soon. I have to admit that it's been a pleasure to visit, but it will be a bigger pleasure to have this event this year all together in one room and doing it. Right. So I'm sure um, the folks will join me, especially Willie and, and the team uh, will join me in, in kind of at least wishing for that and making it happen. So next time. In um, as was said, I have quite a lot of years building electric machines, um, and some of them actually fly. But I think one of the interesting things for me was to look at the field of EV to really to try and imagine how this could work. And I've been, a, I guess, an, an, both an advocate, but also um, kind of a critic of the EV to market, because I was always very worried personally about how simple and safe can we make those systems and how can we make the business model work? And one of my points of decision as to how and where to jump into the uh, eVTOL world had to do exactly with this. And I'll, I'll try to explain 
why and how, but you know what? We're all gathered because we love aviation, we love technology, and we love the progress that these fields are making and what it allows us to do. And it all comes to really one thing we want to do, and we want to do a lot, and that's flying. And one of the beautiful things about Autofly is that it flies, and it flies a lot, and it flies in China. So I'm going to shut up for a second and let the video uh, talk, if you don't mind. So what is Autoflight all about? And I think with your permission, I'll just start with the description of what we do and where we do it. I promise I'll be short because the interesting part is really to see where this is going in the future. Autoflight, as you've seen, is already flying its airplanes. And not all of our flights are as fantastic over the sea and uh, not so far from populated areas. Most of our flights are over open fields and in tests. And the reason we test this so much and so often in the air is because we believe this is the only way to achieve that combination of a simple, safe, and successful aircraft. Now, Autoflight builds its plane around the concept of lift and cruise. So have you, as you've seen in the video, the plane has its lifting system, allowing us to fly faster and further. That transition, or that transition flight has not been performed by a lot of companies around the world. And I'm happy and proud to say that OTA has been doing this for hundreds of times over the last few years. That's the big advantage. That's the place where Autoflight is with its development. And that's very significant because doing that transition at full scale takes a lot. Now, Autoflight controls that configuration, which, as I mentioned, in our model, in our model is, a simple, is, a simple, is a simple, and now after a significant uh, flight test campaign and in the fine, final stages of, of creating that configuration that will eventually go to market, we believe configuration is proven in the sense that we can show that it's safe, we can show that it transitions repeatedly in all kinds of weather, and we can show that this could be controlled correctly. Now. The company is also manufacturing in its three facilities in Jinang, in Kunshan, and in Shanghai, most of the aircraft components. So today we make the composite structure all in Eastern China. We make a battery system based on the growing, very, very robust supply chain that is built around the EV uh, industry in Eastern China taking the cells from the manufacturers, integrating them, testing the systems, and creating our own system again in China. And that lift and cruise configuration is the motors and propellers, and we make them as well. The only thing that we're making right now in more than one place, and I'll talk about our global spread, is actually the flight control system that has been built in China for the Chinese market and is being built in parallel um, based on requirements with our uh, R&D team in Germany. The company over the years has simulated over 300 different patents and they are really what makes Autoflight. 
there is not just a mode of execution, but also a mode of knowledge. And that knowledge is significant, has to do with the flight control uh, system of the aircraft, but also has to do with the motors, the batteries, and different uh, subsystems in it. And I have to tell you, after seeing this in person in my last visit, you can see how these companies have to be actually a cluster of companies that know what they're doing. You have to have a great organization. You have to have you have flight time of people. That's obvious. That's true for any airframer. But if you really want to make an effective, an effective culture system, system, there is a lot to learn and a lot to improve around the torque density and the uh, weight of your motor. If you want to build a safe battery system, there is so much to do and so much to learn about testing and compliance. And these things are really what separates an OEM capable of building a vertically integrated machine, well, with everything else. The company today has three major objectives. One is the soon-to-be headquarter of Autoflight, based in Augsburg, Germany. Today, our design organization, and I'm happy to say that um, also our, uh, let's say, think tank around compliance and certification is based in Augsburg and is working vis-a-vis -vis YASA, the European um, regulator, to get Prosperity One, the airplane you've seen flying, certified in Europe first. We have our foot that is, again, split between Jenin, Kunshan, and Shanghai. both the components and the subsystems and eventually integrate airplanes in China and address the Asian market, but also to do it in a way that leans on the experience that's coming from the team that was founded and, and kind of groomed by Tian Yu, the founder and, and CEO of, uh, of Autoflight, and really lean on that capability. Number three is Autoflight in the US. At the end, it doesn't matter how you look at it, the American market is the biggest market for general aviation and will remain that for quite a while. We have a lot of faith in what America is doing in the world of eVTOL. There are a lot of leading companies out there and we believe there is a lot of room in the market to go there. So our approach is to take the European certified aircraft and then create what's called in the US as soon as we can have because we want to go to that American um, market. So for that, you need your own team in the US to approach that and to create the flight test campaigns needed and the certification effort needed in the US to get that done. And we're building it as we speak. This sounds like a nice, a nice plan, but honestly, this is in our mind also the only way to really build planes correctly. So you have component and system manufacturing in one place. You have flight controls, which are complex from a geopolitical perspective and from an export control perspective, made in Europe and then integrated into the place. And then you have final assembly for each sector and for each market locally, meaning final assembly for the American planes with the different requirements that the FAA will have in America, final assembly for the European market with the different requirements that YASA leads for in Europe and final assembly in China for the Chinese and East Asian market. That's our strategy. That's what we're pushing for. But what you're going to see soon, and we're kind of preparing quite a lot of surprises for 2023, is the plane you've seen flying starting to take to where we're going, which means we're already integrating and making these things ready to fly in Europe and in the US. That's the dream and the reality of Autoflight. I'm excited and proud to be part of it. And I'm super happy to have had the opportunity to talk to you guys about it. So thanks everybody and hope to see you soon in Shanghai, in person, getting this off the air. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, and uh, I'm really delighted to see the quick progress that Autoflight is doing. Last year, the founder, Tian Yu, was presenting here in our session, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so it's great to have you on board in the eVTOL community, because we, I know you remember we had this discussion some time ago, eVTOL makes sense.
or doesn't make sense or how it makes sense and how it can be a business model. But now we see how you, I hope you've gone manage this. Now we change to our next speaker and this is uh, Michael Kugelgen and this is also changing from an American speaking, speaking in California, uh, working for an um, international company which started in Shanghai and uh, now we go to Germany to have uh, Michael Kugelgen of Imagic Aircraft uh, and he's going to present us the progress he was speaking last year he was really the newcomer the new kid on the block although he's uh same as old as me but uh now uh he has some he new, has some new uh, uh details which he's gonna tell us michael i cut my mic yeah. and the screen is you, i see your presentation on the screen so it's all yours uh Billy, thanks a lot for this introduction i hope you can Everything uh, is okay. Yes, we, I hear you fine. Uh, it's fine okay. in the Zoom call, so it's fine in China. Perfect. Yeah, uh, once again, thanks. And uh, I would like to share some ideas with you about our latest project, uh, Pelican. Uh, at the moment, it's a, it's a project. Uh, and uh, the headline is Life is a, is a Matter of Minutes. Uh, and I would like to start with some terrible and hor horrifying numbers. Uh, every year, uh, one 0.35 million people have been killed uh, on the road in traffic. Uh, more than 40 million people are injured. And since the development or uh, invention of the uh, automobile, <clears throat> more than 100 million people have been killed in traffic. Uh, during the last 130 years, streets are more people uh, in comparison to the same time. Same time, uh, uh, killed in, in the war. So uh, our uh, idea our is uh, to develop a complete autonomous flying robot. We call it the Pelican, uh, which has a ca uh, payload capacity of 150 kg with a speed of 160 kilometers. In a range of 150 kilometers, that means it can get, go back and forth for 75 kilometers, and it has an endurance. Uh, of one hour to rescue people uh, which are uh, trapped or uh, uh, injured during a, a car accident. And uh, most important is to, to bring, to deliver this, this as fast as possible uh, to, to the next hospital. And this will be the tool. The advantages in comparison to the actual technology is first of all, it's much cheaper than a helicopter in respect of investment of uh, in respect of maintenance. It's about 20% of the cost. It's faster than every vehicle uh, which is uh, linked to, to the street with detours, with traffic jams. And it's weather uh, independent. If you look at the uh, right picture with uh, this foggy situation, no helicopter can fly uh, at this weather condition. And last but not least, uh, it's very quiet uh, and it doesn't uh, require a, a pilot and a technical, a high technical, high -technical skill. skill. We have a great team uh, with a lot of experts, for example, Florian Holzapfel, who is responsible for, for, uh, for the autonomous flight. Uh, Matthias Stricker, he's doing uh, the mold making and the composite work, his brother, Thomas, uh, he is responsible uh, for the load analysis and for all the testings. Um, Moise Fletchinger is doing the software, uh, and Richard uh, he is uh, developing the propulsion system, especially the propeller. The comp everything is primed by the company MK Technology, uh, who is on the market now for 25 years, uh, and one of the Musk and his company SpaceX. Uh, and we developed for him exclusive the whole, the whole investment casting line to pr produce uh, the rocket engines. And uh, I've, uh, I've been told a couple of weeks ago that thanks to this very innovative and disruptive uh, technology from MK, <clears throat> uh, SpaceX is now able to manufacture one complete 
rocket engine as a raptor each day. each day. During the last three to four years, we developed Magic One. This is a fully electric aircraft with the technical data I shown in the beginning in respect of speed 160 kilometers in respect of endurance one hour. And we are flying this for the last uh, one and a half year. It's fully electric. Uh, it's a single seater, and um, uh, it has a permit to fly. And uh, based on this aerodynamic, based on this technology, and only with a slightly modified fuselage, uh, we uh, we create this pelican. It's the same wing. It's the same wing concept. It's uh, these are the same electric motors, but this. Uh, fuselage is in a way that there is no longer a pilot sitting on top. Uh, it's uh, opening in front and the injured people uh, can be uh, pulled in uh, and delivered to, to the hospital. We have a lot of safety features with this Pelican, same like uh, Magic One. Uh, first, it's uh, aerodynamic. Uh, it's this tandem wing configuration, which is a very stable platform also for the, for the lifting rotors. <clears throat> It's uh, also very stall and spin resistance. And second, we have a ballistic parachute uh, just in case of a failure uh, within the friction of a second, uh, the parachute is deployed. It's a Kevlar motor around at the moment, around the pilot, but in the future about the, uh, the injured peep, uh, person. Uh, and we have this lift and cruise configuration, which is uh, at the moment, and from our point of view, uh, the safest technology. We have a patent uh, for, for this whole technology. Uh, and the next step would be to convert a magic one uh, via new mold making and a new fuselage uh, into the Pelican, which is possible. To fly into a real uh, EASA certification. And for this uh, important two steps, uh, we are looking for funding of uh, up to 25 million euros. Let's summarize the advantages of this technology. The unit price will be something around 750,000 euros. If uh, we are able to cover only 10% of the possible organizations with uh, such a vehicle, we are talking about uh, uh, sales volume up to 8.8 uh, 1.8 million euros. If we are selling this aircraft worldwide, <clears throat> we are uh, we reach 6.5 billion euros. And maybe the most important number is if we are able, thanks to this technology, to save only 1% of the injured people who would be killed normally, if it's only 1%, we would be able with this flying robot, Pelican, to rescue more than 100,000 people's lives. And at the end, I would like to show you uh, the, this aircraft, how it's flying, and most important, because this video is sound of silence, how silent it is. Can you hear it? I hope so. Even the birds are louder than this aircraft. This is a conventional takeoff. And the distance to the camera was maybe nine, eight to nine meters, and we have less than 65 dBA. This is with switched engine off. And now engine is switched on again. When it's further than 100, 150 meters, it's, uh, you don't hear it anymore. And this is a landing. And the most loud, loud, loud of these are the great. And this is like the hover flight with eight electric motors. And thanks to the very low RPM, even the hover flight is very silent. So this was a very short video, and um, 
milestone has been the introduction at the Aero, the, general, the number one exhibition here in Europe for the general aviation. And we received uh, the award for the most innovative electric aircraft design in April. That's for the moment. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Willy. And uh, it's now on your Thank you, Michael. And yeah, that's interesting what you have developed since one year or so, um, changing from the manned aircraft, because I know you're a very ambitious pilot uh, and a long time pilot like myself. So you like flying. Well, I think the first reason why you developed the aircraft is that the market development probably is more demanding for such. Uh, autonomous drone which can, which transport. can transport so it's really interesting to see where the market will go so thank you very much um, tom gunnerson already on so, so back to the united states and michael please stay in uh, line because we will have after tom a quick panel discussion with you three the speakers of the first session um uh, so hi tom again now back Switching uh, across the Atlantic, and um, yeah, so we have had you several times in different roles in our uh, eFlight forum, and this I think is the great thing of the eFlight forum. It was based, and but we really have had speakers, presenters, visitors from around the globe. Uh, the thing is running also as a live stream in YouTube, uh, where we have quite a lot of speakers. So that's why you don't see so many speakers if you're in the Zoom session anymore. And yeah, I'll leave it up to you, Tom, to have the latest news on what Risk Aero is doing in place. Great. Thank you, Willie. And uh, thank you. Uh, to the eFlight forum for this opportunity. Can you hear me okay and see my screen? Excellent. Thank you. So I'm here uh, representing uh, WISP, uh, WISP, and uh, we are looking forward to delivering safe everyday flight for everyone. So a little bit about who we are. We're a company of uh, 500 people, mostly in manufacturing and flight test. We have our headquarters in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. We also have locations in New Zealand, Atlanta, and in Montreal. We have, uh, we have uh, over 180 patents issued to date. 1600 test flights of full scale aircraft. And we're backed by leaders in aviation, the Boeing Company, uh, and uh, which everyone knows, and Kitty Hawk, which is uh, a um, company in the, the Bay Area. So we're a little unique from uh, many of the other companies that are developing the electric air taxis, and that we are starting with uh, a little different approach in that we are going to have an aircraft that is autonomous, uh, so there is no pilot in the cockpit. So our approach to autonomy is that the aircraft systems are designed from the ground up to meet the needs of an autonomous vehicle. So we're not starting with a pilot and then taking the pilot out and having to redesign the aircraft. We believe very strongly in the safety of automation and that it enables uh, vastly improved situational awareness, predictability, consistent decision-making and timely action. It solves uh, the scalability issues in that uh, we don't have to be concerned with the, the uh, having pilots and the capabilities of the autonomy allows for uh, much more uh, frequency of operation. So that's very important to us. And 
Oh, sorry, skipped ahead here. This also improves economics, uh, reduces pilot costs and training requirements. It increases revenue gen generating seats and is easily scalable. So when we talk about economy, um, and, and we use the term health line, what does that mean? So if we look at a scale of the different forms of uh, operation, if we start with what we have today with an onboard pilot, uh, that pilot aviates, navigates, communicates, very traditional uh, method there. If we go to the next step, where we have remote piloting. Now the pilot is on the ground, still aviates, navigates, communicates with uh, basically a cockpit on the ground. And then um, the next level up is autopilot where the pilot is on board, but the aircraft takes over more of the functions. So while the pilot aviates and navigates through the autopilot uh, and communications. Then we move to the development that's happening today that we're working on. This is where we use that term self-flying. This is where the aircraft aviates autonomously with a ground-based operator where that person is, is over the loop versus someone who has a virtual cockpit on the ground. Uh, so we don't uh, use the term pilot in this case. And uh, there's still navigation and a communication. And what most companies will say, regardless of their approach, is that in the long term, they look for uh, total autonomy where the aircraft does it all. It aviates, navigates, communicates, communicates with no human oversight. Uh, that's something that, that I think most of us believe is, is quite a ways off uh, into the future. So we've uh, worked through, uh, the company's been, been in operation for over 10 years. We've had a, a series of uh, aircraft that have uh, developed over time uh, through different generations. We are uh, now at our uh, latest generation, which is what we are calling generation six, which is what we will take to production, which is what you see here. And this is designed for advanced air mobility and it's built for safety. Uh, just to give you a few parameters uh, for the aircraft, it's going to fly. Um, at mid, excuse me, mid altitudes, it's relatively large, 50 foot wingspan. Uh, our goal is to fly urban missions, so relatively short, so you can see the, the range is not um, really far, but it's far enough to do what uh, we believe is the, the core business model with a speed of roughly 110 knots, uh, expecting quite a, a quick turnaround time on charging. Uh, there is storage uh, for carry-ons and personal items. And the operation, again, is, is going to be autonomous. The aircraft will fly itself, but will have human oversight. I have a video here that I hope will work. Let's try it. We have don't have an audio here. Maybe you can talk along. Uh, otherwise, you would have start the sharing again with the audio button on. Uh, no audio. No audio. Yeah. I'll just, um, I'll just uh, let it play through. 
Uh, I okay. think you can probably follow along okay just with the images. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay, so sorry for the, uh, uh oh, uh oh, hold on. Sorry about the lack of uh, audio there. The, uh, the good news is that you can go to our website and see this video and, and hear the audio that goes with it. It's, um, it's worth doing. It gives you a good perspective of what the experience will be like with this uh, aircraft and the operation. So for WISC, uh, these are the, the principal um, areas that we are focused on. Uh, safety is always first. Uh, we're going to have the highest possible safety standard. We're using autonomous flight with human oversight. We have a simplified design no single point of failure. And these are the key enabling elements for autonomous uh, operations that we see. The uh, communication links, uh, really important to have reliable, redundant, and timely fleet-wide ground air command and control capabilities. Uh, Verta ports, streamline capacity balancing and provide real-time beta availability for AAM coordination and operating picture. The expectation is there that we can take all of the different uh, sources of information and be able to use them to be able to have a much higher level of situational awareness than we do today which will help in uh, these scaled operations over time. So those are all under infrastructure. With airspace, 
uh, we expect to start uh, by using the IFR route network. Uh, we think about low level helicopter routes, things like that, that will help support initial operations over urban environments. And then again, with, with the amount of information that we can uh, take advantage of to have 4D flight plans where we have time-based deconfliction to minimize interactions with air traffic control and leveraging the air traffic management modernization efforts that we expect to come over time. And then lastly, with the aircraft itself, having both detect and avoid and landing hazard um, systems that we expect to be able to provide uh, another layer of tactical conflict management to ensure safety of flight. So if we look at that, at this on a timeline, uh, if we look at near term, what we basically have today, uh, the, the conventional and traditional uh, method, that's where we expect initial operations to start with some of the first companies that get their, their uh, aircraft certified and are able to operate. They'll have uh, pilots on board, they'll use the existing systems that are there today. In the midterm, which is where uh, WISP expects to uh, start flying, there'll be both crewed and uncrewed uh, operations with being able to take advantage of 4D trajectory <coughs> and IFR clearances. And we'll, we'll use that self-provided operating picture. And we are working toward helping uh, create a expansion on the air traffic control data com to make sure that the, the data side is fully accessed. And then in the far term, and we're looking, you know, a decade out, decade out. Uh, uh, then we can start talking about the real thing of this and where it starts to pay off in terms of cost to the public to be able to take advantage of it where we have uncrewed high density uh, operations and that's the that's the end goal but that's that's pretty far out there still so that's what i have thank you very much willie i'll turn it back to you thank you very much for this interesting presentation for to all of you and i hope omer will get back up on the screen again as well because he just yeah here he, here he is uh, so i have the first question for for example uh, just to omer because like uh, tom and michael and myself uh, we have a common history because we both we all started with hang gliding uh, and then uh, later doing ultralight and all kind of other flying. Have you done or have you have your personal flying history as well? Uh, yeah, I'm a very mediocre pilot, though. I probably have around 120 to 150 hours um, on uh, on light aircraft. Uh, I do not fly today. I haven't flown in the U.S. Uh, ever, actually. I flew in Israel before uh, before moving here. Okay, when you flew in Israel, then it's interesting because there you nearly could go everywhere with an Evito because it's so small. The country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you if if you went more than an hour in any direction, you're out of the country. So yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. fairly true. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, next question would be to Tom. I've seen now your Generation Six is a tilt rotor aircraft before you have used on the other prototypes lift and cruise is there any special reason for this so um when we we get to the point where we were um, scaling up so to speak our our previous generation was a uh, two passenger this is four passenger um the configuration was uh, maximized for efficiency for which the the design as you see it now with the forward um, motors tilting 90 degrees uh, we found to be most efficient so uh, it's a little different concept there from what we had before but 
we still maintain uh, as much simplicity as possible and that the, the rear uh, propellers don't rotate. Um, everything is fixed on the wing uh, versus having a whole separate um, propulsion system in a different portion of the aircraft. So we're very confident that uh, with that system now, we'll uh, maximize efficiency. Uh, and the other part too is that, that from a, a noise standpoint, this is uh, a system where we can uh, really minimize noise. And of course, we all know how important that is. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, before I ask my next question, I have to say um, to the audience, which is in the Zoom session, you can type in the chat a question, then, when, then we will read them. And to the audience at the real event in China, we have microphone there, so you can lift your hand if you have a question, because it's very seldom that you have got uh, this kind of people, which are really in the core of Evitol, uh, on uh, the, that you can ask them questions directly. So I think maybe uh, you take the chance, uh, the microphone will be available. Um, uh, before I uh, ask my next question, just want to say, maybe you'll say, okay, now you have, um, you have, uh, oh, my screen just disappeared. Now he's back. <laughs> um, now we, uh, you, we have lift and cruise two concepts, we have uh, tilt rotor. Now you think, yeah, but you forgot uh, the multicopter, which is probably the very first one we're gonna fly in our uh, e-flight forum. No, we don't. We will have a um, volocopter in another session tomorrow morning at the same time. And they will talk about their fastest route to the, um, to the way of the, air to get into service because they want to fly 2024 in Paris. And so we'll have somebody of Volocopter speaking on this fast route getting into the air. But my next question, I don't have some from the audience yet, would be to Michael. Um, last year you shared a manned vehicle. I know you're an ambitious pilot, so you wanted to have an EV tool for yourself. And this you realized. Now, um, I see the business model is more the drone. Will the magic aircraft still continue on the manned way or have you uh, take the route now directly to the, uh, to the uh, drone side where you don't have a pilot on board anymore, which uh, then you couldn't fly it anymore unless remote. <laughs> Yeah, really, thanks for this question. Good question. Uh, we will continue in a parallel way. Uh, as you already mentioned, I'm a very ambitious uh, pilot. And of course, I, I will continue in 2023 uh, with, uh, with Magic One and flying it because it's pure fun to, to fly this electric aircraft without almost no vibration and very silent. Uh, but in parallel, uh, we are developing this uh, Pelican drone because uh, as you said already, the bigger market for sure uh, are this drone sector for rescuing and for transporting goods. Uh, so we we continue developing the new the new fuselage because the uh, aerodynamic uh, will re uh, remain the same. I hope this this answers your your question. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, we have a question here, Sin. Yeah, um, hi. Um, this question is for... Yeah, uh, to mute my mic. Yeah, hi, um, Tom, this, is, um, this question is for you. There's some uh, echo. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe speak here. Yeah. Yeah, um, hi, Tom. Uh, this question, actually, there's two questions. One is uh, by taking uh, the full autonomous approach. Um, how much you think um, this will increase the overall cost for certification? Second question is, uh, yeah, by removing um, pilots out of the room, um, the loop, how much do uh, you think this can save the direct operational cost? Thank you. This, by the way, was uh, our uh, editor of the Flying China magazine, Qingguo, 
who has done a lot of work to making this eFlight forum happen. Tom? Who was that too? That was to me? Yeah. Okay, so a uh, two part question. The uh, I'll do it in reverse. So the question to the, the second part about the cost saving, we believe that this is the only way to be able to scale operations. And so from that standpoint alone, um, that's um, going to be a, a huge saving. The uh, Another just obvious one is by not having a pilot on board, you have that much more room either for another passenger seat or for more room for the passengers and uh, luggage. So we're, we're really happy uh, with the, the size of our cabin and the fact that you can take on um, uh, luggage, which um, not sure that's going to be possible with some of the other designs that we've been seeing. Uh, so uh, for us, that's big. The certification part, um, clearly there are, are lots of challenges because it's a very different um, paradigm compared to what we have traditionally with a, the pilot and controller uh, involved with, with um, the flight. And now we're talking about a completely or mostly digital system where uh, there needs to be a lot of um, information that we can provide to show that we can uh, have an equivalent level of safety with a system doing a lot of the pilot functions. And so we're, we're expecting to be spending a lot of time um, proving our case and that it's going to take time. So we're not going to be the, the first company out there operating. We know that and that's okay with us. Uh, we're looking further, further along in the decade before we'll actually be up and flying. And for us, that's fine. We, we are not trying to be first. Uh, we just are going to make sure that we're safe. So we don't put a time on when we expect to actually be operating because we know that's dependent on the regulator and, and whether they're satisfied and they give us our type certificate and our operating certificate, then we'll start flying. Thank you, Dom. Uh, I have another question. I think, yeah, we have a little bit time still for questions uh, in this session. Um, to Omer, um, you, I know you're flying in China. I know that there uh, will be an aircraft in Europe soon that I heard from European colleagues. Um, will there be an aircraft coming to United States as well flying uh, soon this year or when the American can have a look at this? You're still muted, Omar, so. Omar, you're still muted? Okay. Okay, now I'm fine. Um, yeah. yeah, good Good question. The simple answer is yes. We will bring a plane to the US as well. One of the advantages uh, of our setup right now is that we have uh, multiple operating airplanes and we're creating kind of the structure and the flight control system for the different um, regulatory environments, I would say. We will have um, a plane and we will have flights in the US, I mean, test flights, obviously, in the US and in Europe in 2023. So that's, that's a statement you can bank on. Okay, that's good. Um, so I also hope to see you at not only test flights, because some of the companies are test flying in very secret remote areas. So it's very difficult for the audience to see it. So I hope also to see you at one of the shows maybe at Aero, maybe at uh, Le Bourget or in Oshkosh. Uh, so um, do you think you're going to be at one of this around? Uh, absolutely. I think flying in those shows at this stage, stage is uh, complicated, to say the least. And that's why we probably won't have the test flights happening um, on those sites. I think that's probably true for all developers. The, maturity level that is achieved is not yet at the point that you feel comfortable flying shoulder to shoulder with a, an A350 or a 787. So um, I, I would say that probably not uh, test flights in the La Bourgeoisie and Oshkosh opportunities, but uh, keep your ears <laughs> uh, sharpened and, and kind of listening 
uh, will definitely be out there uh, in summer 2023. And same question to Michael. Michael, um, will uh, your aircraft again? You were again, you were last, 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 last. Will you receive the aircraft again uh, next uh, year? Next uh, year. Uh, any event? Any event? international uh, events uh, to come uh, where we ought to plan to participate okay that's great so uh Charles, i know you i have seen you at the arrow show yourself not as exhibitor but will there be a time when whisk maybe also show up at one of these shows or if there's not in your focus at the moment so at some point yes of course um in the short term, probably not, um, mainly because we're, we're really heads down into developing the aircraft. Um, and we wanna make sure that, that when we are ready to begin to, to show it off to the public, that it's in a, a, a mature form. Um, we don't think there's, there's that much to gain with showing off a prototype other than, than flying it. I think a lot of people enjoy seeing that, but um, uh, we'll see. I, I think that, that again, we're a little behind most other who are starting with a pilot. Um, so if you just factor that in, um, you might not see us in the near future, but, but we're coming, I promise. Okay, thank you very much. And, but I hope yourself, I will see you at Arrow again, like, uh, Gamma meetings and so on. Certainly planning on that. Okay, great. So maybe if you're interested, if you like the session, um, just be at the Aero next April because uh, we will have sessions like this one here as well. And I hope to see you all there again. Now I shouldn't talk longer because we are at the time where we have to stop the Q and A sessions. So if you have any further questions. Uh, to our audience, just keep them until uh, Arrow or write them to us and we will cover them because we have, uh, we're uh, there, you also can see the sessions right now because we have our, let me just see where we have it. Uh, we have our journal where we cover the uh, electric aircraft. You see the eFly journal where we also cover this event here and we cover all the news which are happening. Thanks for the session number one. And I would uh, hope that, uh, thank you again, especially for Tom and Omer getting up that early. And thank you to Michael and yeah, stay tuned. <laughs>